Okay, welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm your host, Imran Ansari, and we have been watching uh, riveting testimony from Alec Murdoch, who, of course, took the stand in his own defense uh, starting yesterday testifying and cross-examination uh, roughly going about six hours today and the prosecution just uh, commenced or, or just ceased their cross-examination, I should say, and we expect most likely some redirect. Uh, and this gives me a great opportunity as we wait for that break between cross-examination and redirect to bring in my guest and chat about what we just saw uh, and what we saw today. So joining me in the studio here in New York City is Gabriel Sepulveda Sanchez. He is a trial attorney out of Los Angeles. And also now joining me for this hour is Bob Mata. He is a criminal defense attorney uh, in Chicago and also has a great podcast that you should check out called The Defense Diaries. Uh, thank you for joining me, gentlemen. And Gabriel, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, um, we have been seeing this cross-examination go through the course of this day. Um, within the last hour that you and I have been watching, at least in the studio here, uh, what are some of your big takeaways from what we saw with the prosecution ending their roughly six hours of cross-examination of Alec Murdoch? I mean, it's obvious that the defendant is not credible. We've, they've, they've, I think it was a little overkill with that. And yeah, we all know he's not, he's a liar. We all know that. But the question is, is he lying about killing his wife and son? And um, I, I thought the DA talked a little bit too much. is a little bit too theatrical. And I think that the best trial lawyers I know, you just make your points and you let the defendant hang himself and you don't talk that much. He, he kind of, the focus was on the DA too much instead of the defendant. And I always think that's a bad idea. Um, I still, there's not, I, I think there's some, st there's still some issues with the, the prosecution's case. Um, what's the motive? Yeah, we know he's a liar. We know that. Don't, he's, we, he's made that very clear. That, that it, they could have shaved off two hours of uh, cross-examination. They didn't need to do all that. They think it was overkill on that issue. We know he's not credible, but what's the motive? That just because you're a liar doesn't mean you would kill your own wife and son. So yeah. I don't, I think they're weak on motive. Right. And I think they better figure out you know they need to they need to they need to they need to hammer that home a little bit and uh you know just because he's a liar doesn't mean he killed his wife and son i think there's some and i think that he's got a good defense lawyer and, it, and they can create some doubt um but the fact that he is a liar is not helping his case either so you know my opinion it it, it, it can go either way right now the way i see it yeah no okay bro i think there's some yeah. real credibility uh, issues and the prosecution was able to show that through cross-examination. Bob, I want to go to you. You're a criminal defense attorney. Uh, and of course, Dick Harputlian and the defense team uh, most likely had that very tough decision. Uh, and they were probably behind closed doors speaking with Alec Murdoch and making that tough decision. Do we put him on the stand? And of course, we've now seen hours of testimony, both on direct and cross-examination from Alec Murdoch. Um, just explain to our viewers, uh, based on your experience, how do you get to that decision? Um, of course, a case is a case-by-case -case basis, but how do you get to that decision with your client uh, as a criminal defense attorney of whether they're going to testify in their own defense? Well, first and foremost, I mean, what I want the viewers to understand completely that that is completely the defendant's choice. The defense attorneys can scream and yell, no, don't do it, don't do it. At the end of the day, it is only one person's decision, and, and that's the defendant. So, of course, you know, there, there were massive amounts of conversation that went on with respect to whether or not he was going to testify. And I'm sure both Jim and, and Dick gave what their, you know, opinion as to whether or not he should testify. But at the end of the day, if, if Murdoch was dead set on testifying, they couldn't have stopped him anyway. So I, I think at that point, once they became aware that that was his intent, then what you have to do is game plan um, and, and try to figure out the most effective way to get him through it uh, without him uh, just getting just slaughtered up there by the prosecution. Now, that, that's going to bring me to my next point. I've been watching six hours of Creighton Waters uh, basically doing a, a, a direct examination. Mm -hmm. that, there is very little cross-examination going on. When you're allowing the defendant to basically run the entire examination by giving 10-minute narratives, that is not how a cross is supposed to be. It's supposed to be with leading questions where you're basically just allowing them to say yes or no. That is that is very rarely happening in this cross. Um, I, 
you know, I, I've been stunned by it and I've been tweeting about it for two days. Uh, it, it has not been an effective cross-examination in my estimation. Yeah, and Bobby, you know, that your next point was actually going to be uh, my next question. I was going to make that note because when you are cross-examining a witness like this, especially as a prosecutor in this case, uh, or a case like this, you're not going to allow those narratives to go out there. You're not going to allow the defendant to necessarily explain uh, and control the narrative on a cross-examination. That's your point to go in, score points on those leading questions, and really knock out whatever was established, if at all, uh, on direct. And now it's your opportunity to really go at uh, the criminal defendant uh, when they typically enjoy the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. So I, I agree with you with that. But do you think, Bob, that there may be a strategy here uh, from the prosecution, from Cretan Waters, that um, allowing uh, Alec Murdoch to sort of go on these narratives may be uh, playing in the prosecution's favor uh, because he's not credible? I, I mean, maybe, but now it's over. I mean, there's going to be a redirect, and theoretically there could be a recross, but at this point, he survived it, in my estimation. I mean, look, we all know the guy's a liar. He's a self-admitted liar. He's a self-admitted thief. I mean, he laid on that sword. That's done. So at this point, we still need to try to figure out, is the guy a murderer? Because that's what this case is about. I mean, we're talking the entirety of yesterday's cross-examination was all about the financials. And I keep going back to this point. These jurors do not have notebooks. And if you don't understand the significance of that, in terms of serving on a jury, we are now going into what, the 26th, 27th day of trial. There's been countless witnesses and there's been a ton of information, including massive amounts of timelines and just cell phone data, GPS data. These jurors have not had the ability to write one thing down. And, and then when you, you just collapse that on top of the fact that you have a broken up narrative with respect to the state's case in chief, you know, where it's like, is this a murder case or is this a financial crimes case? I don't know, man. I'm coming I'm coming hardcore on a, on a hung jury with this one. All you need is one, and there's bound to be one person that either believes Murdoch or just didn't understand the state's case. Yeah, there, there's Bob Mata's calling it as a possible hung jury. Of course, we're going to wait and see, uh, and we're all waiting to see what's going to happen next. And what is happening next, uh, Gabriel, uh, is that there's going to be redirect. And mm -hmm. we've talked about the cross-examination, whether it was successful, whether they really, uh, as a prosecution, um, scored some points here. Um, what do you expect to see after hearing and seeing that cross uh, from the defense team on redirect? You just, we all know he's a liar. He's admitted to it. The, the defense lawyers are not disputing that either, I'm sure. But. Uh, just going in and saying, hey, did you, did you kill your wife and son? And you just really, because that's, this is what this case is about. It's not about whether you're a liar or not. There's a lot of liars out there in the world, a lot of liars that are husbands and, you know, and, and you know, it, it's about whether he killed his son, uh, his son and wife. And he needs to, he's going to go on direct and, and, and put that issue out there and, and let the defendant testify about whether he did or not. And, Really, it's just about what the jury is going to believe. And um, I really I didn't like that cross-examination at all. I thought, like, I agree with everyone here. You know, your, your point of cross-examination, leading questions, get your concessions in. Yes or no. Yes. Yes or no. And let the jury make the decision. And I thought the DA was very theatrical, and he was doing more, a lot of talking. And, and I always think that you got to remember as a trial attorney, it's not about you. It's about your clients. And it's about with the state's case, or it's about the defendant's case. So um, I thought it was too focused on him, and I think he, it was. I don't think it was a very good cross at all. And uh, I, I think uh, I'm leaning towards the defense in this case. I think the defense lawyer is going to get a good uh, redirect, and he's going to put it out there. Did you kill your wife or son? This is what it's about. No. And to be, honest, in my opinion, just looking at him as a lay, as a just trying to state as a lay witness, he looks. You know, yeah, he's a liar. He's the most likable guy. No, but he he comes off. <laughs> this might be a part of his personality or whatever, but he doesn't come off as a bad witness. And, and I'm surprised that they didn't get, he didn't get destroyed on on cross examination. And he doesn't come off that bad as a witness, in my opinion. He's a liar, but he's he's doing all right. He's holding up on cross. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Bob. Uh, 
So you made a great point here uh, that these jurors do not have notebooks. And we are now weeks into this trial, a lot of evidence before this jury, a lot of testimony before this jury. I just want to fast forward a little. I know we're, we're waiting for the redirect here and possibly recross based on that redirect. But how are you now organizing yourself as a defense attorney um, in this case um, with this amount of evidence um, for summations? You know, how are you going to bring it to the jury? And I said defense attorney, I should say whether you're a prosecutor in this case or on the defense team, how are you organizing that evidence and getting it sort of in a package for this jury um, as you make your arguments? What would you do? In terms of the prosecution, they really have to try to tie it together. You know, you've got this motive that is, seems far afoot. Um, you know, I, I didn't love it when I first heard it. And I was hoping that they would be able to tie it in a little more closely. I, I mean, I see somewhat of a nexus. I, I see where they came up with it, but am I buying it? Not necessarily, you know, but it's not about me. The question is, are those 12 jurors and the alternates buying it? And, you know, when you've got a motive like that, and let's be clear, you know, you don't have to prove motive. Juries like to know about a motive because they want to try to understand why somebody may have done something. So it's not an element of the crime. So it doesn't have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. But if you've got a motive where the motive kind of took over the heart of the case, the, the prosecution's number one goal has to be, let's tighten this up. We have to make it a, a, a like a strong narrative so that they can understand it. Right. And I mean, that's the only way that they, they are going to be able to succeed, as far as I can tell. Yeah, and the jury likes to always have the who, what, where, and why. You don't have to prove it uh, as a prosecutor, the why, but juries love to hear about a motive. So we're going to go back live into court now. We see that uh, Dick Harputlian is standing up, and I think there may be redirect about to start. Let's go live into court right now. Okay, welcome back to Law & Crime. I'm your host, Imran Ansari, and we have been watching live all day the trial of Alec Murdoch in South Carolina. And today, Alec Murdoch, on his second day on the stand uh, in that courtroom with uh, about six hours, 20 minutes of cross-examination by the prosecution. And then we just ended the day uh, with some redirect and brief recross. Uh, and the jurors have gone home for the day, and court's going to reconvene next week. Uh, my understanding is that next week there's going to be uh, four witnesses for the defense on Monday, and they're going to wrap up. There's going to be a rebuttal case we expect from the prosecution. And then uh, as early as Wednesday next week, uh, we expect to see and hear summations in this case. Uh, a lot of evidence over the course of these past weeks that the attorneys on both sides are going to have to sum up and give to that jury along with their arguments. But let's bring in my two great guests who have been with me in this hour. Uh, in the studio, I have Gabriel Sepulveda Sanchez, a trial attorney out of Los Angeles. I also have Bob Moda in Chicago. Gabriel, I want to start with you um, with this question. I, we uh, talked, Bob and I, before the break about his sort of take on what we saw with the redirect and recross. What do you think? Do you think the defense were able to clean up uh, anything from the prosecution's cross? Uh, and what about the recross? Do you think that um, it was short? Uh, you think it was, was it sweet? Did it give anything to the prosecution that they needed? It's kind of what I expected. You know, I. I said what this case is about, it's about, yes, we know you're a liar, and he, on, on redirect, uh, um, you know, he, they pretty much had him to explain, yes, I lied about this, yes, I lied about that, and did you kill your wife and son, though? And he said, no, you know, I would never hurt him. And I think, you know, that was, that's the, what they wanted to, that's what this case is all about, and he wanted to, they wanted to get that on, on re, um, redirect. Um, I do agree with Bob's uh, uh, insight on why didn't they really explain why um, Alex Murdoch didn't, uh, why he lied about being at the kennel at that certain time and being the first to come onto the scene because that you guys had a really good point about that. I mean, if you're the first to walk onto a scene, especially as lawyers, we're already thinking, oh man, I'm the first to discover the dead body. Like, oh, they're gonna think it was me already. So that is a real good motive for why he did lie to the investigators initially. So I agree with you, with both your insights on that. I think, um, they should have brought that. They should have brought that out more, and right. that's a good motive for for lying. Hey, I don't want to be accused of this. They're already going to look at yeah. me as a suspect, so they should have brought that out more. Right. I, 
And, and Bob, I want to get your take on this. We have interesting uh, uh, news uh, coming out of that courtroom from our reporter, Gigi McKelvey, who's been in the courtroom. Uh, she let us know that there was a female juror uh, in the courtroom uh, that stuck tissues in her ears today. Um, and, and also the same woman yesterday, the same juror, uh, placed a blanket over her head. Uh, and we don't know the reason behind it, but what's your thoughts about that? That's something which is interesting and uh, why it hasn't been addressed yet in court. That's a mystery. I, I can tell you if I'm Dick Carpuglian or Jim Griffin, I'm going, I'm calling, uh, I'm asking to step up to the bench and finding out uh what's going on with her i'm gonna have the judge ask her exactly what is going on because if she is refusing to listen to the defendant testify which is what it implies that she's doing she needs to be excused you can't have somebody like i, I don't know whether or not she was able to hear through the tissue but either way uh, i'm moving to have her removed from the jury immediately i, I know they're getting down to maybe the last uh, alternate but right. i mean you've got to have jurors that are attentive i mean yeah. this is life and death literally absolutely so not a game bob i'm gonna have to cut you off but i want to thank you both for joining me today here at law and crime stay tuned here at law and crime.